The History of the Harrietenberg and its Environs, Part 3 The Kleinplatz Revolution and the Battle of Wrinkle Wood. Kleinplatz was a small place situated on the road between Krasenbacher and Dryways. Now, Krasenbacher was very definitely part of the country of Schnifflstadt, and Dryways was very definitely part of the country of Harrietten. But the status of Kleinplatz was not so clear. It was certainly nearer to Dryways than it was to Krasenbacher. However, it lay on the western, that is the Schnifflstadt side, of the Truffelwood, which formed a natural boundary between the lands of Schnifflstadt and those of Harrietten. To be honest, Kleinplatz was such a small place that no one had really bothered about it, and for generations the Kleinplatzers had elected their own mayors to look after their own affairs and minded their own business. They certainly didn't pay any taxes to either Schnifflstadt or Harrietten. However, about a century previously, Schnifflstadt had set up a customs post at Kleinplatz, charging taxes on goods coming into or out of Schnifflstadt territory by this route. As these taxes were not charged on goods produced by or consumed by the citizens of Kleinplatz, the people of Kleinplatz had always been indifferent to the existence of this customs post, except for the landlord of the customs building, who was very glad of the rent. Shortly after the promotion of Baron Spankiewicz to Grand Marshal of Harrietten, a certain Jacob Radek arrived in Kleinplatz. Herr Radek claimed to have been born in Kleinplatz, although no one seemed to remember him. Although he announced that he had returned to the town of his birth to live out the remainder of his days, he brought no luggage other than one small valise. He took a room at the Saucy Buttercup, which was the finest public house in Kleinplatz. Kleinplatz was famous for its dairy products, and the buttercup was the unofficial symbol of the town. A few days after his arrival, a wagon from Harrietten, via Dryways, passed through Kleinplatz on its way to Schnifflstadt, via Krasenbacher. There was nothing untoward about this wagon. It stopped at the customs post and paid the necessary duty on its cargo of spiced salami, made from finest wild boar, hunted on the slopes of the Harrietenberg. But it did also stop at the saucy buttercup, and drop off a small crate of personal belongings for Jacob Radek. The servant who carried this crate up to Jacob Radek's room noticed that it was stamped Herr Druckermann and Sons, Printers, Harrietten. Shortly thereafter, a pamphlet started to circulate in Kleinplatz. It pointed out the large amount of tax collected by the customs post and stated that all this was sent back to Schnifflstadt, where the Empress Eloise of the Petty States spent it on fancy tea and exotic snuff imported at great cost. It asked why the Empress was unable to drink beer and smoke a pipe like everybody else. It suggested that, as all this money was raised in Kleinplatz, it should all be spent in Kleinplatz to benefit Kleinplatz. A couple of days later, the inhabitants of Kleinplatz awoke to find a poster pasted on several walls throughout the town. Over a background of buttercups it read, Freedom for Kleinplatz! Let 1,000 flowers bloom! Walking through the streets of Kleinplatz, it was notable that many houses were displaying a vase of yellow flowers in the window, and that many people were wearing buttercups in their buttonholes. The following week, there was a public meeting in the town square. A selection of orators harangued a large crowd with details of how Schnifflstadt in general and the dissipated Empress Eloise in particular were bleeding Kleinplatz dry. Jacob Radek was not present. Following the meeting, the customs post was burnt down by an angry mob 
which also rounded up the Schnifelstadt customs officials and drummed them out of town. The following day, Jacob Radek went to see the mayor, who was sitting in his office with his head in his hands. Jacob suggested that Schnifelstadt in general, and the Empress Eloise in particular, would not be best pleased with the events of the previous night. The mayor agreed. Jacob suggested that Schnifelstadt might choose to take punitive action against Kleinplatz as a result. The mayor agreed. Jacob suggested that this might be rather unpleasant for the population of Kleinplatz in general and the mayor in particular. The mayor agreed. Jacob suggested that the mayor might wish to seek support from Harrietten and mentioned that the Grand Marshal of Harrietten, Baron Spankowitz, happened to be in dryways and would be happy to pop over to Kleinplatz and have a chat. The mayor agreed. A few days later, the mayor of Kleinplatz held a public meeting in the town square. He announced that Kleinplatz had severed all ties with Schnifelstadt. He announced that Kleinplatz had entered into an alliance with Harrietten, which had pledged to protect Kleinplatz from any aggressive act by Schnifelstadt or its allies. He announced that the Schnifelstadt customs post would be replaced by a Harrietten customs post and that half of the revenue raised by this customs post would be paid into Kleinplatz's public treasury to be spent in the public interest, as decided by the mayor. Finally, he announced that, in the public interest, he had decided that Kleinplatz would raise three companies of light infantry for its own defence and the defence of its allies. These announcements were all met by great public acclaim. However, in private, some particularly cynical people observed that the income that Kleinplatz would receive from the customs post would only just cover the wages of the soldiers to be recruited, and that while Kleinplatz was no longer under the thumb of the Empress Eloise of the Petty States, it was instead under the heel of the Countess Harriet von Harrietten. After the meeting, Jacob Radek was offered a salaried post, paid from the public treasury, as Colonel of the 1st and only Regiment of Kleinplatz Light Infantry. He accepted the job. On hearing this news, the Empress Eloise immediately sent a messenger to the Honourable Mary Green to gather her forces in the south of Greenmead, ready to march on dryways if required. She then summoned Colonel von Flussing and Colonel Ritter the commanding officers of the old boys and the Krasenbackers respectively, to a meeting. Gentlemen, she said, the position is grave. To the west, the army of Panini is at our gates, shortly to be joined by the forces of Drek. In the east, Kleinplatz has revolted and joined forces with Harrietten. The immediate threat is the armies of Panini and Drek, we will not be in a position to fight them until the Fancy Boys and the troops of Negroni join us. I have therefore invited King Leonardo to a peace conference, so we can keep him talking for a few days. In the meantime, you will identify a position on the road to Schnifelstadt that we can defend if needs be. Once we have dealt with Panini and Drek, we will turn our attention to Kleinplatz. She turned to Colonel Ritter. As a girl, she said, my father told me many tales of the glorious Krasenbackers and their countless victories. Under your command, the Krasenbackers have been defeated by some mustachioed men in pink and a straggling band of irregular troops hiding in a hedge. I expect more from my cavalry. Do not disappoint me again. Following his victory at the Battle of Tripod Farm, King Leonardo ignored the advice of both Viscount Colonel Bellapasta and Colonel Melanzani to immediately march into Schnifelstadt and impose terms. He knew that Schnifelstadt had more forces than he had faced and that they would fight hard in defence of the city. He therefore preferred to wait for Earl Ulrich and his men. Two days after the battle, the Earl arrived 
as did an invitation from the Empress Eloise to attend a peace conference. The peace conference took place under a flag of truce in an ornate marquee a mile or two from Tripod Farm, down the road towards Snifflestadt. The Empress Eloise opened the proceedings. Gentlemen, she said, I am Eloise von Schniffelstadt, Empress of the petty states of Greenmead, Kleinplatz and Negroni, and Countess von Schniffelstadt. We know who you are, woman, snapped Earl Ulrich the angry. Get on with it. What terms do you propose for your surrender? Without provocation, you and your armies have wantonly and violently attacked the fair lands of Schniffelstadt, continued the Empress. In violation of all the accepted rules of war, you have committed the atrocity of firing cannon at my troops as if they were ships. We were sorely provoked, shouted Earl Ulrich. Thanks to your unjust and punitive taxes, my subjects have suffered frost-bitten ears all winter. On a technical point, interjected King Leonardo, as I understand the rules of war, it is legitimate to try to eliminate an enemy army by any means possible. To this purpose, I do not believe the use of cannon is unreasonable. I have only used artillery against military targets and not against civilians. I resent the implication that I have behaved in a manner that does not befit a gentleman and I ask you to withdraw that foul slur against me. I did not wish to insult you, said the Empress Eloise. I only observe that the use of cannon in such a manner is unprecedented among civilised peoples. However, I am a magnanimous and merciful Empress, and as such I will not destroy you and your armies, on condition that you immediately vacate my territory. With all due respect, said King Leonardo, you are in no position to dictate terms. We are in possession of sheep and Panneberg. The road to Schniffelstadt is open to us. If you cede to us the towns that we already hold, and pay each of us one million gold thalers in compensation, then we will cease hostilities. And, added Earl Ulrich, Unless you stop talking nonsense and agree to these terms, then we will march on Schniffelstadt, take all the funds in your treasury, and you will no longer be an empress or a countess or anything at all. Do you understand? Thank you both for your proposal, said the Empress Eloise. I will need to discuss it with my advisers. I suggest that we break the meeting at this point and resume our discussion tomorrow, when I have had the opportunity to do so. Very well, spat Earl Ulrich. You have until tomorrow to accept our terms. The following day, the meeting reconvened. Good morning, gentlemen, said the Empress Eloise. I am Eloise von Schniffelstadt. Empress of the petty states of Greenmead, Kleinplatz and Negroni, and Countess von Schniffelstadt. As indeed you were yesterday, observed Earl Ulrich testily. Do you accept our terms or not? Having conferred with my counsellors, continued the Empress Eloise, I must report that we cannot spare two million gold thalers from our treasury at present. Also, I do not believe that it would be just to impose alien rule upon my loyal subjects in Panneberg and Sheep. Your loyal subjects in Sheep were very welcoming when my army walked in, said Earl Ulrich. I do not think they would mind becoming subjects of Drek. If you reject our terms, that means war. The Empress Eloise pointed out that she was already at war with Drek. The discussion grew heated. King Leonardo asked whether the Empress had any alternative proposals. I'm glad you asked that, said the Empress. In fact, I do. I am prepared to waive export duty on any cedar squirrel fur imported by Drek from Schniffelstadt, as long as that cedar squirrel fur 
was imported into Schnifelstadt by way of Negroni. King Leonardo raised an eyebrow. That is not acceptable, he said. Earl Ulrich looked thoughtful. That proposal might work, he mused, on condition that sheep is ceded to me. King Leonardo looked at Earl Ulrich. I need to discuss matters with my allies, he said. I suggest that we reconvene this meeting tomorrow when I have had a chance to do so. That evening, the Fancy Boys and the army of Negroni arrived in Schnifelstadt. The following day, the meeting reconvened. Good morning, gentlemen, said the Empress Eloise. I am Eloise von Schnifelstadt, Empress of the Petty States of Greenmead, Kleinplatz and Negroni, and Countess von Schnifelstadt. We know said both King Leonardo and Earl Ulrich in unison. Well then, the Empress Eloise said, know that these discussions end here. All offers are off the table. Withdraw from my realm or face the consequences. And she walked out of the conference. The following morning, the combined armies of Panini and Drek marched southeast along the road to Schnifelstadt. A few miles outside Schnifelstadt, on the left hand of the road, stood Finger Farm, so called as it was located at the tip of Finger Ridge, which is a low ridge running down to the road from the northeast. Beyond Finger Farm, the road turned sharply left to go around Wrinkle Ridge, another low ridge but running up from the southwest. On the top of Wrinkle Ridge stands Wrinkle Farm. The road then bends right to pass between the tip of Wrinkle Ridge and Wrinkle Wood, which is on the left of the road, before heading onward to Schnifelstadt. This was the landscape where Colonel von Flussing and Colonel Ritter had decided a battle would be joined. The Empress Eloise placed her fancy boys on Wrinkle Ridge, along a hedgerow in front of Wrinkle Farm. The Negroni Grenadiers formed a line running from Wrinkle Ridge across the road to Wrinkle Wood. Further back along the road, those old boys who had survived the cannon barrage at Tripod Farm were placed in reserve, along with Captain Schweif's 4th Squadron of Krasenbackers, still at full strength. The other three squadrons of Krasenbackers had all been mauled at Tripod Farm and were very much under strength. On the right flank, atop Finger Ridge, were stationed the 1st and 2nd Squadrons under Captain Apfel Schimmel and Captain Schecker, respectively. Atop Wrinkle Ridge, to the left of the Fancy Boys, was placed the 3rd Squadron of Krasenbackers, still under the command of Captain Krupper, who had survived unscathed both the bullets of the Panini King's skirmishers and the swords of the Panini Royal Horse Regiment. Colonel Ritter had informed his captains that the honour of the Krasenbacher Regiment was at stake in this battle. Their job was to eliminate the enemy cavalry and to prevent King Leonardo's cannon from coming into action. The Empress Eloise did not approve of and was not familiar with the use of light infantry. She ordered Captain Ponzi's Purple Mountain Bersaglieri to take an advance position at Finger Farm, with the object of disrupting the enemy advance prior to the main engagement. King Leonardo XIII marched his royal grenadiers along the road, followed by the first and only battery of the King's artillery. Behind followed Earl Ulric, Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar and the Earl's own regiment. In front and to the right marched columns of Drekensbach Jaeger Corps, with the King's skirmishers in column to the left. Each flank was covered by a squadron of the Royal Horse Regiment. Observing the purple uniforms of Ponzi's Purple Mountain Bersaglieri lurking behind the hedge around Finger Farm, King Leonardo ordered the King's skirmishers to deploy into line to screen the troops moving up the road. He also ordered his cavalry to ride forward, to cover his flanks against the squadrons of Krasenbackers 
he could see on the hills on either side. Earl Ulrich was less circumspect. He turned to Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar. Do those ridiculous purple excuses for light infantry think we can't see them? he asked. The Drekensback Jaeger Corps will teach them how to do things properly. He ordered the bugles to sound the requisite calls, and both companies of the Drekensback Jaeger Corps advanced in column at the double, ghostly in their grey uniforms, the breeze rippling the fur on their cedar squirrel hats. From the top of Finger Ridge, the first and second squadrons of Krasenbackers saw the second squadron of the Royal Horse Regiment advancing towards them. Captain Apfelschimmel trotted over to Captain Shecker. Is that the mob which did Krupper's lot over? he asked. No, said Captain Shecker. That was the first squadron. What a pity, sighed Captain Apfelschimmel. Still, I suppose we had better kill them anyway. The first and second squadrons of Krasenbackers trotted down the hill. The first squadron of the Royal Horse Regiment charged to meet them. But the Krasenbacker's blood was up. To a Krasenbacker, the honour of the regiment was everything, and that honour had been questioned. Many of King Leonardo's men were rapidly impaled on cold Schnifflestadt steel, and the remainder fled the field. Meanwhile, the second company of the Drekensback Jaeger Corps formed into line and started firing through the hedge into Ponzi's Purple Mountain Bersaglieri. While the Bersaglieri were distracted by this, the first company of the Drekensback Jaeger Corps, still in column, charged into the field and into their left flank. Captain Ponzi weighed up his options. He was outnumbered and had no support. He decided to run away. Meanwhile, on King Leonardo's right, the first squadron of the Royal Horse Regiment advanced towards Captain Krupper's third squadron of Krasenbackers. Eager to avenge the events at Tripod Farm, Captain Krupper did what he did best and ordered his men to charge. The resulting cavalry melee was prolonged. At first, the impetus of Captain Krupper's charge looked as though it would sweep away his adversaries. But the Royal Horse rallied. They outnumbered the Krasenbackers and slowly started to gain the upper hand. Colonel Ritter observed the proceedings from the top of Wrinkle Ridge, where he stood beside the Empress Eloise. My Empress, he inquired, please can you spare me for a while? I believe my subordinate may require assistance. The Empress Eloise nodded her consent, and Colonel Ritter galloped down the hill to where the 4th Squadron was waiting in reserve. Ordering Captain Schweif and his men to follow him, he then galloped back over the hill to the assistance of Captain Krupper. He was too late. As he topped Wrinkle Ridge, he saw the last remnants of the 3rd Squadron surrounded by a sea of thrusting sword blades. Then the sea rolled in and submerged the Krasenbackers. For one moment, the waters rolled back and Captain Krupper could be seen, alone and bloodstained, fighting like a madman. But then he disappeared, cut down by his enemies. The third squadron of Krasenbackers had been eliminated from the battle as a fighting force. The first squadron of the Royal Horse Regiment did not enjoy their victory for long. Colonel Ritter and the fourth squadron of Krasenbackers came sweeping down the hill, a rolling thunder of hooves and horse flesh and steel, and destroyed them. On the other flank, King Leonardo had ordered the King's skirmishers to wheel and push forward to screen the left flank of the army as it continued to advance. Undeterred by this, the first and second squadrons of Krasenbackers simply rode around the King's skirmishers and advanced toward the road. Seeing King Leonardo's artillery in front of him, Captain Shecker sensed an opportunity and ordered his men to charge. 
Crown Prince Leonardo saw him coming and ordered his battery forward at the double, veering off the road to the right to take shelter behind the Royal Grenadiers. At the same time, Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar ordered the Earl's own regiment forward to close up to the Royal Grenadiers, to fix bayonets and to left turn. Confronted by the resulting line of steady, green-coated infantry, Captain Shecker turned away, and he and Captain Apfelschimmel led their respective squadrons back toward Finger Ridge. As the Krasenbachers fell back, the armies of Panini and Dreck continued to advance. Both companies of the Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps advanced across the fields of Finger Farm, and the line infantry and artillery marched along the road beside those fields. Meanwhile, the King's skirmishers advanced toward Finger Ridge. It was now Colonel Ritter's turn to see an opportunity to attack the first battery of King Leonardo's artillery. The fourth squadron of Krasenbachers started to move forward. Sensing the danger, Colonel Viscount Bellapasta ordered the Royal Grenadiers to right turn and form a line behind which the artillery could shelter. But Colonel Ritter was not a man to be balked. He led his men in a disordered gallop around the Royal Grenadiers. The Krasenbachers straggled out as they rode around the flank and behind the infantry, but the leading riders, Colonel Ritter and Captain Schweif among them, reached the rear of the column of guns, where they did considerable damage before the Royal Grenadiers about turned and charged into them with bayonets. I have heard it said that Colonel Ritter and Captain Schweif was so preoccupied attempting to spike one of the guns, which was not a task with which they were familiar, that they did not notice that they were surrounded by Royal Grenadiers brandishing bayonets until Viscount Colonel Bellapasta cleared his throat and suggested that they might wish to desist and hand their swords to him. Whether or not this is true, it is certain that both men were taken prisoner at this point, and that the 4th Squadron of Krasenbachers was eliminated from the battle as a fighting force. Having seen off the 4th Squadron of Krasenbachers, the armies of Panini and Dreck continued to advance. Both companies of the Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps formed into line. The Royal Grenadiers continued to advance along the road, while the artillery, accompanied by the Earl's own regiment, turned left off the road to form up behind the light infantry screen. On top of Finger Ridge, Captain Shecker grew restless and galloped the second squadron of Krasenbachers across the face of the leading company of the Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps to take up a position on the other flank. The first squadron of Krasenbachers held their position on Finger Ridge. As the enemy forces advanced beneath him, Captain Apfelschimmel realised that he had an opportunity to charge obliquely into their rear and, in particular, to charge what was left of the king's artillery. He raised his sword. For the honour of the regiment, he cried, pointed his sword directly at the offending cannon and galloped down the hill, followed by his men. As the cavalry approached the cannon, a company of the Earl's own regiment stepped forward, levelled their guns and fired. The fire was accurate and destructive. Captain Apfelschimmel was shot in the head and fell dead from his horse. The charge never reached the cannon, and the first squadron of Krasenbachers was eliminated from the battle as a fighting force. The Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps continued to advance, each company forming a skirmish line, one firing on the Fancy Boys and one on the Negroni Grenadiers. Both the Fancy Boys and the Negroni Grenadiers fired back. Meanwhile, the Royal Grenadiers formed into line behind the screen provided by the Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps, and the Crown Prince Leonardo led the King's artillery up to the foot of Finger Ridge and ordered it to unlimber its cannon. The Dreckensbach Jaeger Corps started to break up and fall back under the weight of fire from the Fancy Boys and the Negroni Grenadiers. Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar turned to Earl Ulrich and asked if the Earl's own regiment should advance. 
Earl Ulrich expressed an opinion that it was the turn of the Panini infantry to do some fighting, and ordered the Earl's own regiment to deploy in a line behind the Royal Grenadiers, where they could provide support if needed. Crown Prince Leonardo peered through the gun smoke, waiting for the Dreckensback Jaeger Corps to get out of the way so he could get a clear shot at the Negroni Grenadiers. Seeing that the Krasenbackers had vacated Finger Ridge, Captain Gelato ordered the King's skirmishers to occupy it. On the opposite flank, Captain Shecker observed the cannon coming into action and, in a final desperate fling of the dice, ordered the second squadron of Krasenbackers to charge right between the lines of the Royal Grenadiers and the Earl's own regiment into the first battery of the King's artillery. He achieved complete surprise. The Krasenbackers galloped past the entire length of the Earl's own regiment at a distance of a few yards without a single shot being fired at them and crashed into the artillery, slaughtering the cannon crews, dismounting the guns and rendering them inoperable. The Crown Prince Leonardo took shelter under a limber. Earl Ulrich turned to Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar. So much for the King's artillery, he said. These Krasenbackers are stupid, but they are brave. Finish them. Lieutenant Colonel Ragnar gave the orders. The left flank company of the Earl's own regiment fixed bayonets, levelled their muskets, fired a volley and charged, and the second squadron of Krasenbackers was eliminated from the battle as a fighting force. The Crown Prince Leonardo emerged from under his limber and stepped over the dead body of Captain Shecker. Captain Shecker's horse had been shot and fallen, and he had been bayoneted as he struggled to his feet. Seeing the Dreckensback Jaeger corps falling back in front of him, Colonel Larderstock ordered the Fancy Boys to advance after them. The Fancy Boys pushed through the hedge that had been sheltering them. Seeing this, the Dreckensback Jaeger corps fell further back, through the ranks of the Royal Grenadiers, but a parting shot fired as they did so shattered Colonel Larderstock's shoulder and put him out of action. Leaderless, the fancy boys wavered. Sensing their opportunity, the Royal Grenadiers stepped forward and discharged a volley of fire into the fancy boys, mauling them badly. Observing this from Wrinkle Ridge, the Empress Eloise rode down the hill and into the thick of the firefight, rallying the fancy boys and urging them to continued efforts. But despite her encouragement, the fancy boys were having the worst of it. On the other side of the battlefield, Captain Gelato saw an opportunity to get behind the Negroni Grenadiers and ordered the King's skirmishers to march down from Finger Ridge into Wrinkle Wood. Observing this, Colonel von Flussing ordered the old boys to advance up the road to provide support to the Negroni Grenadiers if required. The Fancy Boys fought bravely, but they were doomed. Surrounded by dead, dying and fleeing soldiers, the Empress Eloise realised she could not fight the Royal Grenadiers single-handed. As the Fancy Boys disintegrated, she rode over to Colonel Lacardi and the Negroni Grenadiers. At this point, the company of Dreckensback Jaeger Corps in front of the Negroni Grenadiers fell back, and the King's Grenadiers and the Negroni Grenadiers had their first clear sight of each other. Now, the nations of Negroni and Panini did not get on. Apart from their mercantile rivalry, the citizens of Negroni regarded the subjects of Panini as backward relics of a bygone age, while the subjects of Panini regarded the citizens of Negroni as insolent upstarts with no breeding. Colonel, said the Empress Eloise, we have been bested and we are outnumbered. We should withdraw. Colonel Lacardi looked her in the eye. Not until I have destroyed those turquoise poppin jays, he said, pointing at the Royal Grenadiers. It is more likely that they will destroy you, she replied. Then so be it, said the colonel, turned to his men and gave the order to advance. Both regiments of grenadiers moved toward each other and commenced a brutal and ferocious firefight. 
Inflamed by mutual enmity, the men on both sides were oblivious to the mounds of dead and dying building up around them, fighting on when any sane men would long have fled. The battle was won by Captain Gelato, who emerged with the king's skirmishers from Wrinkle Wood to the rear of the Negroni Grenadiers. With bullets now coming at them from both directions, the Negroni Grenadiers fought on, but their numbers were being eroded at a faster rate than those of the Royal Grenadiers. Colonel von Flussing provided a moment of respite. He ordered the old boys to advance toward the King's skirmishers, who retreated back into the wood, where the ordered ranks of the old boys could not follow. He then marched his men up to the Negroni Grenadiers, where he saluted the Empress Eloise and said, My Empress, the battle is lost. We should leave. Now. At this point, a bullet passed through the Empress' imperial bonnet, severely disarranging it. Yes, said the Empress. I think you are right. And with that, the Empress Eloise, Colonel von Flussing and the old boys withdrew along the road to Schniffelstadt. As they marched past Wrinklewood, the king's skirmishers re-emerged and recommenced their fire upon the rear of the Negroni grenadiers. The end was near now. No quarter was asked for and none was offered. Thus ended the stand of the Negroni grenadiers. Thus ended the Battle of Wrinklewood and thus ended the Cedar Squirrel War. <laughs>